As America toyed with empire, foreign affairs remained largely remote to everyone but the president in early 20th century America. For Theodore or Teddy Roosevelt, a gulf existed between civilized and uncivilized nations, and as president, he reserved the right to intervene in the affairs of backwards, mostly non-white, nations for the supposed benefit of both. That belief that America had an obligation to help police the world um, drove Roosevelt to invest heavily in America's Navy. Roosevelt's Navy helped assert American power in places like Japan and Latin America. And in doing so, we asserted pressure on other world powers like Germany and Russia. Convinced that weakness in the Western Hemisphere, specifically South America, threatened American interests, Roosevelt announced his Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine was um, quite old at this point. It was President Monroe's policy to treat efforts by European nations, um, efforts to colonize land or interfere with states, specifically in South America, to treat them as acts of aggression that required U.S. intervention. So what Roosevelt's doing is saying, yes, if you mess with the Western Hemisphere, you're messing with us. Not only that, but if, if you are a country in the Western Hemisphere that is failing or is doing something bad or wrong, we reserve the right to go in and fix it. So he extended James Monroe's policy by claiming an American right to intervene in the affairs of Western Hemisphere nations should those nations be unable to manage their own affairs. And he did so in the Dominican Republic, where America assumed control over, over economic policy when uh, the Dominican Republic um, began to fail on it, the debts that it owed to European creditors. The most celebrated foreign um, policy accomplishment of Roosevelt's presidency was the construction, though, of the Panama Canal, which still today links the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. In order to secure more favorable terms than the Colombian Senate would agree to, Roosevelt helped organize and finance a revolution in that part of Colombia. Roosevelt landed American troops from the USS Nashville in the area to maintain order, and he recognized Panama as an independent nation. The new Panamanian government quickly agreed to favorable terms with the Americans, and the Panama Canal was quickly financed and completed. This is really interesting. We don't like the terms that uh, the Colombians are giving us when we've got this plan to create this very business-friendly canal linking, uh, cutting through uh, Central America and linking both oceans. And so we take it a step further, what we're doing in South America. We organize a coup. We, we invent a country from scratch, essentially, recognize it, uh, and um, we, we get our way. Roosevelt talked softly, but carried a big stick. Uh, his successor, William Howard Taft, uh, showed little interest in Roosevelt's imperialism. We talked about uh, Taft a little bit before in the last lecture. When Woodrow Wilson assumed the presidency after Taft, he, fa he faced international challenges of a scope and seriousness unmatched by any president who came before him. And even though he's a Democrat, he's much more like Roosevelt than Taft was. In 1915, he sent Marines into Haiti to quell a revolution that killed their president. And American officers even drafted the new Haitian constitution. Uh, Wilson bought the Danish West Indies, now the U.S. Virgin Islands, when he feared Germany would seize them. And Wilson drafted a deal with Nicaragua to prevent Europeans from building a canal that uh, might rival the Panama Canal. So both American parties, under the Republicans Roosevelt, now under the Democrats uh, Woodrow Wilson, both, both parties are assuming assuming uh, an imperialist spirit that America should, ought to, and, and has to um, seriously influence politics uh, all across the world. And this is a totally new era than before. We're no longer isolationists in this era. Wilson, a Democrat, was different than his Republican predecessors, however, where Taft's government had quietly supported a bloody reactionary coup in Mexico. Uh, it was part of an effort to put back in place a pro-American business president, uh, Wilson refused to support the government of butchers his predecessor had helped put in place. What had happened was um, there was an effort in Mexico to actually get a constitutional Republican um, government, and our Republican government, Taft, um, had him killed because the government beforehand was corrupt but very uh, supportive of American business interests. Wilson entertained the idea of supporting constitutionalists that Taft had not, uh, people like Pancho Villa, but he ultimately threw his support to the most powerful group in, Mex uh, in Mexico City. Pancho Villa considered that a betrayal and crossed the border into New Mexico to kill 17 Americans. Uh, Wilson ordered General uh, John J. Pershing into Mexico to find Pancho Villa, 
but all that did was push both nations to the brink of war, and Villa was never found. As peace collapsed in Europe, um, so we're shifting gears dramatically here, Wilson simply withdrew American troops from Mexico and granted formal recognition to the constitutionalists in Mexico, clearly a better outcome than what Taft had planned. Um, but we pick up, essentially, and leave where we're at because Europe is sliding into war. In 1914, the precarious, precarious rather, international peace that held Europe um, slid into total global war on the basis of what seemed to be a series of minor political incidents. The major powers of Europe were organized in 1914 into two competing alliances. Uh, we'll call one the Allies, uh, that was Britain, France, and Russia. The other we'll call the Central Powers, although both these groups have different names. We'll call them by their traditional names. The Central Powers were um, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. The chief conflict, though, was between Great Britain and Germany. And it came to a head when the Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated by Serbian separatists, uh, which isn't a, a minor event, but it is clearly a local event. Um, that local controversy escalated through the complex system of alliances that had held Europe together. Everything was a set of dominoes, and this, this assassination sent, um, required all of these alliances to, to come to fruition. Germany used the incident to declare war on France. Great Britain jumped into the war in support of that alliance with France, while Russia and, Austria and the Austro-Hungarian Empire formalized war shortly thereafter. So within months, all these dominoes had fallen, and all the major players had chosen a side, and virtually the entire European continent and part, uh, and a part of Asia, too, was embroiled in this, in this war that stretched the entire continent. So before this assassination, before some of these events in Serbia, um, everything was, it was like, uh, like a tinderbox ready to be lit up. It was like a powder keg that just needed a single spark, and that's all it was. Although Wilson asked Americans to remain impartial in the European war, most Americans sympathized with Britain. Economic realities, including the British blockade, also made it impossible for the United States to deal with the war on equal terms. And so we're thinking here between Britain and Germany specifically, because those are the ma major players on both sides. Brutal German tactics, too, pushed Americans away from supporting Germany in the conflict, although some of those tactics were exaggerated. Uh, the British had a propaganda effort to um, that uh, likened Germans to brutal Huns and exaggerated some of the brutalities of the war. The sinking, uh, the, the major event though, is the sinking of the British passenger liner, the Lusitania, by German submarines. Uh, that was the nail in the coffin. 1,198 innocent civilians, including 128 Americans, died in the attack. So it's a German submarine that just it sinks this liner, this like pleasure boat um, out in the Atlantic. And Germany declared any ship at sea is, is fair game, but they killed a bunch of innocent civilians, and that is essentially what made America side against, or with the British, but against the Germans. American domestic politics, though, prevented Wilson uh, from committing the United States to war after the attack. The question of whether America should make military and economic preparations for war sparked a heated uh, debate between pacifists and interventionists. So even though most people supported Britain, a lot of people did not want to go to war. Though Wilson began to build up the American military after the sinking of the Lusitania, Democrats used the slogan, he kept us out of war, at the Democratic Convention in 1916, and Wilson squeaked out a narrow victory to earn a second presidential term. So he's a peace candidate um, at the end of his first term, his first term as president. Early in that second term, though, he supplied his own justification for American intervention pretty much united public opinion in America. In his speech before Congress in January of 1917, after he won that election, he presented a plan for a post-war order in which a permanent league of nations would maintain a peace, a peace without victory, he called it. Germany reacted by unleashing unrestricted submarine warfare against American and allied ships. So we hadn't committed to the war at all, but what Wilson's doing is saying, like, I've got a plan for when this thing's over. We're not going to have provocations, like we're not going to have nations like Germany starting wars after this is over. So in late February, American, uh, so let me take a step back, Germany uh, began to shoot at American ships at sea um, and treat them like allies. In late February, Americans intercepted a telegram sent by a German force, uh, foreign minister named Zimmerman. It was a telegram that was being sent to Mexico, the government of Mexico. It proposed that in the event of war between Germany and the United States, Mexico should join with Germany 
against the Americans, and in turn they would get the lost provinces of the north, so places like uh, New Mexico and West Texas after the war. So Germany is secretly trying to um, get Mexico to join the war on behalf of Germany. Uh, it's called the Zimmerman Telegram. It inflamed public opinion and built immediate sentiment for war in America. Less than one month later, a revolution in Russia put in place a new Republican government, which made the idea of America joining the Allies much more palatable. So um, we are much more likely to join the war because of these two events, specifically the Zimmerman Telegram shows and makes it crystal clear that Germany wants, um, wants to attack America. And the fact that Russia is a lot more like us all of a sudden, they have a, a much more similar government, makes it much easier for us to actually join in on behalf of the Allies. On the rainy evening of April 2nd, two weeks after German subs torpedoed three American ships after the, Lusit the Lusitania, Wilson appeared before Congress to ask for a declaration of war. It was granted for it. It was not unanimous. Um, like six senators and about 50 House members voted against the war. European armies stuck at a stalemate for years and exhausted by the time America entered the war um, really needed America on their side. America's Navy immediately helped to limit Allied losses at sea, but a major commitment of American troops became necessary when Russia, led by um, Vladimir Lenin and his new communist government in Russia, cut a deal with the Central Powers and retreated back home, freeing up many uh, thousands and perhaps even a million more German troops for the Western Front. Despite some controversy, uh, Wilson won passage of the Selective Service Act in mid-May, which brought another three million uh, American men into the military. So we weren't quite ready for war. We had two million men ready to go. Um, but when Russia strikes this peace, goes back home, all that eastern front of the war is over. And so there's all these new Germans coming in. And so if the Allies are going to win, the Americans have to um, train up, get there, and get to the Western Front. When this new crop of soldiers, called the American Expeditionary Force, or the AEF, finally hit the European continent, they used their raw numbers to beat back every German advance, or nearly every German advance they faced. Faced with an invasion of their own country, uh, German military leaders pressed for an armistice, or an end to the fighting, uh, refused to totally surrender. On November 11th, 1918, more than four years after it began, the Great War, as it was known before it was known as World War I, uh, shuddered to a close. World War I was a proving ground for a range of new military technologies. Trench warfare epitomizes the conflict. The, the enormous destructive power of newly improved machine guns and artillery forced men to, uh, into ditches they built to hold their positions. Anyone in traditional open field position was an easy target, so they dug these big ditch trenches in the ground and it would just hold the line and would occasionally fire at one, other, one another. But they're just muddy and they're, um, they're disease ridden. It's not, um, it's a totally different kind of war. New technology too threatened men that were safe, in parentheses, in their trenches. Tanks and flamethrowers and chemical weapons and fighter planes made it possible to attack soldiers from more of a distance. The Navy modernized quickly in the war and came to rely on diesel engines, turbine propulsion, hydraulic uh, gun controls, electronic, or excuse me, electric light and power, wireless telegraphy, and advanced navigational aids for their ships. All the technology made possible the stunning number of casualties attributed to the war. Nearly 9 million European men were killed over those four years. 1 million of those men were British, 1.7 million were French, there were 2 million Germans that died, 1.7 million Russians, the list goes on. Only 112,000 Americans died in the war because we weren't there very long, and half of those Americans died of the flu. There's this terrible flu pandemic that uh, accompanied the war and actually was happening back home too. Comparatively, we suffered very little casualties. All of this new technology required new systems of economic and logistical management just to keep up. The federal government appropriated $32 billion for the war effort, where the annual budget of the United States had rarely breached $1 billion previously. To raise all that money, the government sold $23 billion in liberty bonds to the American public. So um, it was a promise to pay it back later. Instead of just printing money, uh, this is better. Um, people invested in the government, gave them money freely, and then the government had, uh, was going to pay it back gradually over time. It also put new heavy taxes and excess profits on corporations and individuals in high uh, income tax brackets. So they really, put the, uh, they really put the income tax to use, and that's relatively new during this time. Some income tax brackets were as high as 70%. So 70% of what you made went to the American government if you made you know, 
well, 500,000, a million, 5 million, 10 million. To organize the economy for the war, Wilson implemented war boards to advise American industries to ensure needs were met without paralyzing the domestic economy. So the war required companies to kind of change up what they were making, how they were making it to ship it overseas. The War Industries Board coordinated, coordinated government purchases of military supplies, was prone to serious corruption, while the National War Labor Board pressured industry to grant important concessions to workers, including the eight-hour workday, in order to avoid strikes that might hurt the flow of goods on the war front. So the war kind of changes a lot of things back home, like the whole economy and the whole nation has to reorganize just to make it possible. To ensure American commitment to the cause, the Committee on Public Information, or the CPI, organized a massive propaganda campaign. 75 million pieces of printed material went out in support of the war, and journalists were encouraged to exercise self-censorship when reporting more news. To suppress dissent, the CPI paid for advertisements in magazines that asked citizens to report to the authorities any evidence among their neighbors of disloyalty or disfavor with the cause. Citizens groups uh, emerged to root out disloyalty in places like German-American communities in America. Um, and they did other things like banned expressions of German culture, uh, including uh, music, food, uh, and books specifically. They called um, sauerkraut, liberty cabbage, etc. Many German-Americans were fired from their wartime jobs on the suspicion that they could be secret saboteurs, that perhaps if you're you're German, you're a little suspect um, during the war, even if you oppose what Germany was doing, which most did. Um, so oftentimes there was a concern that you might be sympathetic, that you might throw a monkey wrench into the machine you're working at in the factory. So a lot of Germans lost their jobs during the war. The, es uh, the Espionage Act of 1917 gave the government um, the new tools or new tools to combat spying, sabotage, or more vaguely obstruction of the war effort. The Sabotage Act and the Sedition Act made it illegal to publicly express opposition to the war and allowed officials to prosecute anyone who criticized the president or the government. Those tools were put into use against specific groups of people, including the Socialist Party and the International Workers of the World, um, a pro-union group. In all, 1,500 people were arrested in 1918 for, simply for opposing the war. In his search for a new world order, President Wilson laid out his aims for the post-war world. His 14 points, as he called them, fell into three broad categories. Eight were recommendations for adjusting post-war boundaries, so w where a country begins and where it ends. Um, and that's, that's a source of a lot of the conflict, actually, in the war, is where, you know, where, whose land is whose, essentially. Uh, five of the 14 points were general principles that would govern international conduct after the war. And they're good goals, freedom of the seas, uh, open covenants instead of secret treaties, so no more secret treaties and freedom of the seas. Anyone can uh, sail essentially anywhere on, on the open water. Uh, reductions in weapon stockpiles was another. Um, free trade among nations and impartial mediation of colonial claims. And finally, his last point was a League of Nations. It was a proposal, it's a proposal that a League of Nations um, that would be designed uh, with representatives from all the countries that would implement these new, these new principles including territorial adjustments, and resolve future international conflicts. His vision reflected his belief that the world was capable of a just and efficient global government. But other European powers and American Republicans back home were in no mood for a generous or egalitarian peace process. Peace conference. Wilson was greeted by European leaders who wanted to punish Germany harshly for the war. And he was unable to win approval of some of his broadest principles. His only major accomplishment was the creation of a permanent international organization to oversee world affairs. In early 1919, the Allies voted to accept the covenant of the League of Nations. They accepted it in principle, but they had to go back home and try to sell it to the people. And it's his most, it's Wilson's, of his 14 points, it's the one that he's most fond of. Um, Wilson presented the Treaty of Versailles to the American Senate uh, shortly after the Paris Peace Conference but ran into vind uh, vindictive Republican opposition. So this is the, his effort to get the League of Nations formally supported by the American government. Not to be done in, he embarked on a grueling 8,000-mile cross-country speaking tour to arouse public support for the League of Nations. But toward the end of his tour, he suffered a, se a series of health problems, including a massive stroke, and the treaty went unapproved. And he never really, he remained in office as president, but he was ill the whole time. At home after the war, the nation struggled to reconvert to the pre-war economy. 
inflation raged uh, during this time, and prices rose like 15% each year. So if a gallon of milk was 50 cents the next year, it was, oh, I can't do that math, 58 cents. Um, prices go up very significantly um, for a couple of years. And 5 million people lost their jobs, while labor unrest increased dramatically right after the war. 1919 saw an unprecedented wave of strikes in America, too. So when all these soldiers return, uh, everything kind of goes crazy. In Seattle, a walkout by shipyard workers evolved into a general strike that brought the entire city to a standstill. In Boston, police struck, uh, struck or went on strike to demand recognition of their union. The city erupted into violence and looting when there were no police officers, and the National Guard had to be called in by President Calvin Coolidge. Coolidge declared there is no right to strike against the public safety, and he tapped into this broad middle-class hostility to unions and strikes. He helped, uh, Coolidge helped defeat the greatest strike of the era, one that involved 350,000 steel workers across several Midwestern cities, which climaxed in Gary, Indiana, where 18 strike workers were killed in an effort to put the strike down. Though black World War I veterans were celebrated alongside their white counterparts when they came back uh, after the war and were given parades, white Americans did little to incorporate blacks into everyday life. Blacks, though, were more determined than ever to fight for their rights. After half a million blacks moved to the industrial north during the war, from the rural south where the racial climate had become savage and murderous, um, in 1919 more than 70 blacks were lynched in the south. And then even in the north where the blacks had moved, uh, white workers convinced that blacks were making the workplace more competitive. Uh, that increased tensions in places like Chicago and St. Louis. In Chicago, for instance, during the red summer of 1919, where all these new African Americans are living and working, um, the stoning, the impromptu stoning of a black teenager that had floated near a white beach. He was out swimming. He got near a white beach. People threw rocks at him. He uh, was knocked out and drowned. It led to rioting that, uh, that shut down the city in the, in the middle of a very hot summer. It shut it down for a week. It's rioting where, for the first time in American history, blacks actually fought back. And the birth of black nationalism was really born. Um, so blacks begin to fight for their rights when they get back from the war. Some of those men that were lynched in the South were actually veterans of World War I, too. That's worth mentioning. There's an effort after what happened in Chicago for blacks to really take control uh, or power in northern cities. Um, there's all these movements, these black national movements, including a movement to move back to Africa um, led by a man named Garvey. Many Americans regard, uh, regarded the industrial warfare and racial violence of 1919 as frightening omens of instability and radicalism after the war. After the rough, uh, Russian Revolution of 1917, 1917 uh, communism was no longer just a theory, but the basis of an important global government and economy. In addition, the Soviet government announced the formation of a communist international whose purpose was to export revolution all across the world. Pockets of radicals did exist in America in this era, and they did attack people and positions of power in the United States using mostly um, bombs and coordinated bomb detonations. One such bomb killed 38 people on Wall Street, for instance. Uh, in response, individual states began to pass laws to imprison political radicals, but the greatest contribution to the fear of communist influence came from the federal government itself. So very, there were very few legitimate radical communists in America, but um, there's this big, big scare that they're going to affect um, or have some impact in America in this era. On New Year's Day 1920, the Un uh, United States Attorney General and his young assistant J. Edgar Hoover orchestrated a raid on alleged radical centers throughout the country, and they arrested more than 6,000 people. Most of these people were not radicals, but it, the Red Scare was essentially born. This idea that communists live, um, lived among us and were secretly plotting to overthrow a Republican, Democratic form of government, um, it's really born after, uh, at the behest of the federal government. Though most Americans feared the influence of communism, some stood up to the federal government's heavy-handed often unconstitutional efforts to root out subversion. The American Civil Liberties Union, or the ACLU, was born in this era, and it's still very important in America today. And people accused of political dissent began to lean more heavily on the Bill of Rights to protect themselves and their politics. The Supreme Court in this era tilted in favor of freedom of speech, and in doing so put in place the legal precedents we still rely on today. It's silly to think that you could be put in prison for something you think or say today, um, but it, was only, it took people saying, uh, we have this Bill of Rights, we have this First Amendment, I am protected, you can't put me in jail. We had to go through the courts to make that uh, legal precedent, even though it's protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution.
this is when that happens. In many ways, 1920 and the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote, this marked the end of the era of progressive reform in America. Warren G. Harding, a Republican, uh, became president. He embraced no soaring ideals, only, only offering a vague promise of a return to normalcy in America. His election signaled a retreat from the spirit of idealism that had marked the progressive era of Teddy Roosevelt and President Woodrow Wilson. 